Thank you for choosing Access On Demand. Access believes in continuing education, and we create content to empower you to learn and grow anytime, anywhere. Let's get started. Welcome, everyone, to today's webinar. I'm Bob Holly, the editor of Home Healthcare News. I'm looking forward to hosting today's webinar, the PDGM Two-Step, Ensuring Financial and Operational Success. Access has been a huge resource for a lot of agencies during this transition to PDGM, so a big shout out to them for sponsoring this webinar and sharing some valuable insights today. Um, before we get started, did want to go over a couple of quick housekeeping items. First, please note that phone lines have been muted for sound quality. We should have time for questions toward the end of this webinar, so please write in your questions using the question box on your screen throughout the presentation. We'll get to as many as we can. And today's webinar is being recorded and will be sent via email afterward along with the slides. Uh, before we get started, let's just go over some quick background on our speakers for today. Joining us is Tammy Ross, Senior Vice President of Professional Services at Access. She leads a team of professionals whose goal is to provide practical operational solutions to home health, hospice, and home care agencies. Uh, Tammy has 30 years of home health experience and has been a senior executive of a large national home health agency herself. So lots of great experience with Tammy. Also joining us today is David Hoover, Vice President of Revenue Cycle Management for Access. He leads the company's billing, electronic data interchange, and payer management service teams. Prior to joining Access, David served in the leadership roles at Cotivity, where he developed new processes and systems focused on increased efficiency and quality in auditing, recovering, and development services. With those introductions, I'll go ahead and turn this conversation over to our experts. Thank you. Let's see, make sure everything's moving correctly. All right. So, doing the two step, and some of you may have heard or seen us do this two step before, but we've adjusted it just a little bit. Um, before we were doing kind of preparation, and now we want to talk about now that we're in PDGM, what are the things that finance and operation uh, need to continue doing uh, to make the adjustment as smooth as possible? You, when when the when we're out of step with uh, finance and operations, it seems a little confusing. Uh, we want to make sure that we're in step, so that we're communicating and everything is flowing smoothly couple of objectives that we want to make sure that we accomplish with this is we want to uh, identify a few key focus areas uh, in the revenue cycle under PDGM. We want to make sure that we understand the impact of various challenges in PDGM. We've mentioned those before in prior engagement or prior presentations, uh, but we want to make sure everybody's clear about what's going on in PDGM right now. We also want to make sure that we have uh, provide you some operational best practices uh, as we address some of these challenges and uh, these key focus areas. We want to give you some uh, key things to do and look at in your operations to uh, make sure that you're doing these or continuing or expanding some of these uh, best practices. So the first thing I would like to do is just make sure we get a good firm uh, baseline about how the rate determination under PDGM. We have admission source and timing. Uh, that comes from the claims. That's the community or institutional from the source and early or late from uh, the timing of the claim itself. Uh, start of cares will always be early and then you'll have the late uh, if there's anything else that comes after that. Clinical grouping, uh, that comes from your principal diagnosis that's reported on the claim. Uh, this is the kind of the basis of PDGM. Uh, this is uh, all of the groupings. We have multiple different ones, including the MMTA, which there's different categories under each one. Each one of these clinical groupings has its own um, weight and, and scoring for reimbursement purposes. Functional impairment level, this is the one item that's still left over from the OASIS, uh, low, medium, and high, and it does have a, a pretty significant financial impact on the reimbursement. 
comorbidity adjustment. This comes from, and we have up here, secondary diagnosis. I still like to call it subsequent diagnosis because it doesn't necessarily have to be in the second position, uh, but this is from diagnosis that match up with the primary. We'll talk, uh, Tammy will talk a little bit more about this uh, later on in the presentation, uh, but it could give you additional uh, payment due to the comorbidity interaction uh, that's going on with the episode. So one quick <clears throat> reference back to preparation for PDGM. We've talked about having an impact model and understanding uh, what PDGM could affect and what, what we were kind of looking for. A uh, couple of key areas of questionable encounter code. Uh, these are codes that can't be grouped under PDGM and we were talking about trying to make sure that we eliminate those and move towards making sure that we had diagnosis that were there that were groupable. Uh, talking about full episode pay uh, and only having 30 days uh, since we have two uh, billing periods now, two 30-day billing periods in the episode. Also talking about LUPAs and then also talking about the changes in reimbursement for a full 60-day episode determined bec uh, based on the PDGM grouping and early and late and in institution and community. So those were the four key areas, uh, the biggest impacts. We also talked about the clinical groupings and understanding the case mix and understanding that there will be a, a different reimbursement uh, for multiple different case mix and really understanding what your agency is doing and what type of case mix that it has uh, that sometimes uh, moving towards more uh, higher pay for wound care, be it an example, may be an opportunity uh, if you were avoiding it before because now the reimbursement is higher but understanding that those case mix also come with additional costs. Everybody understands that wound care uh, tends to be a little bit higher cost in supplies. Also, we talked about key performance indicators, uh, and this is even you know, gonna be more important, uh, important as we move into PDGM is understanding and monitoring these things. Uh, looking at the census, knowing how much is coming from community versus institutional, especially if you are looking at your marketing and how you're marketing or who you're marketing to, where your refer referral sources are coming from, understanding your early and late admissions and how that balances out. Looking at start of episodes, looking at the uh, days to build wraps and days to build finals, those are key components right now. Uh, with 230 days and having everything uh, having to be completed in a much shorter time frame is going to be key to cash flow management. So those are key areas to watch. Looking at, uh, in the bottom right hand corner, we're looking at the different types of LUPAs and average revenue uh, per episode, uh, making sure we understand how to li limit any changes in LUPAs and any adjustments that come down. Uh, the financials at the very top, understanding how much of your business is coming from each case mix and if that needs to be adjusted or changed. Those are just some of the key performance indicators that everybody should start to try to look at and understand in their business. So, Tammy, I want to talk about PDGM focus number one. Um, and we're going to change the verbiage a little bit and call it ungroupable diagnosis code instead of the, the uh, questionable encounter code. Since we're in it now, these are actually should uh, cause a stop in your reimbursement because they can't be diagnosed as you can't get a HERG. Uh, so it will cause a dead stop now that we're in PDGM. Uh, so these are not specified enough to be in the PDGM model. It causes bill of rejections and denials uh, from the max. So this will delay our cash flow. Um, and it will uh, cause us to uh, expend more uh, time and effort and resources to obtain the correct diagnosis and, and resubmit the claim, the adjusted claim, once we've uh, obtained that information. So thanks, David. We, we've actually have started solving for that at an operational level. The first thing we did is work with our data analytics to come up with kind of the top uh, ungroupable diagnoses, those ones that we're using quite often. And unfortunately, a lot of those diagnoses are the codes that 
you know, we've been using 20 years plus in home health, like muscle weakness, um, encounter for caught fall, ataxic gait. And generally, we rely on these diagnoses because our referral sources don't give us enough information to be able to code these more specific, specifically. So what we have done is really started a campaign uh, with our physicians and our referral sources, letting them know that there has been a change in reimbursement and also letting them know why we need these additional codes. Um, if we'll just go to the next slide, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how to interact with those physicians. Um, that's often the look we get when we go to the physicians, you're asking more of me why. Um, and oftentimes when there's a change in home health, you'll hear physicians and providers saying, I'm out. I'm just not going to refer to home health anymore. Um, it requires too much of my time. These are, these are some of the pushbacks that we get. I don't know any more than you have on file about um, that condition. I'm giving you all I have. Um, these, are, these are things that we get for pushback. I like to take a step back here and remind physicians it's maybe a good idea to start your campaign uh, with your account executives, your sales team about care plan oversight. And there is a lot of work that goes into managing a home health patient, both on the provider side and the physician side. Um, Medicare actually recognized that and in 1995 actually set up um, a billing code for that and it's called CPO, Care Plan Oversight. Um, they also provided codes for certification and recertification. Um, and with this, CMS tells physicians, we recognize it takes a lot of time for you to manage these cases. And if you're spending at least 30 minutes of time per calendar month on a home health patient, coordinating with that agency and coordinating the care for that patient, we're going to pay you for that. We're going to allow you to bill for that. And that's over $100, um, depending on their MSA code. And just knowing that that's more than they would get if that person actually walked in their office and, and had a visit with that physician, sometimes it helps that physician to be um, a little bit more uh, malleable to work with and a little bit more accepting um, of the additional information that we need on the home health side. We also need to adjust our workflow. Um, I like to think about coding being put kind of on the front side now. And I know that we have to lay eyes on the patient. We have to see what's going on with that patient before we can determine primary diagnosis. But oftentimes we're getting a lot of that information up front. If I wait till my OASIS assessment is completed, David, I'm not gonna be able to drop that wrap in five days like you want me to. So what I want to do is start working on that coding. If I see some of those codes that will not fall into a clinical grouping, start working to get those codes correctly, um, correct and identified at the point of intake. The other thing is nurses are not computers. Uh, we cannot keep up with all of those codes that won't uh, create a diagnosis, those ungroupable diagnosis. It's about half of the codes um, that we can't use now uh, at, under PDGM. So technology, we have to rely on technology to tell us if we're using a code that's not going to create that grouper. And I think most of our technology companies do have that built into their software um, now. We also have to make sure that we have a quality improvement process in place so that if something is happening that is not creating um, a groupable code, what are the mechanisms that we're doing to find out that information? At what point do we start intervening? And, and I want to just say here, we always want to use the most appropriate codes. Um, you talked a little bit about the sequential coding or secondary codes. Um, and, and looking at those codes, we want to make sure if we're choosing a code, we're not just choosing a code based on the fact that it's going to increase our reimbursement but based on the fact that it is going um, to paint that picture for that patient. And CMS is actually looking at this too. That's one of the reasons behavioral adjustment was built in. It's because in their minds, they think we'll start choosing um, different codes now to define our patients. It's gonna create uh, more revenue. 
I would argue, that of course, we're going to do that because we can't use half the codes we used to use anymore. So, but just want to say, if you're picking a code and you're using a code, you do have to be compliant with that code. Uh, using coding partners is a good strategy that a lot of agencies are going to now, and David, it's one I want to go to. I want to find a really good coding partner that we can utilize to help me with this coding process. I want to be able to reach out to that partner and know that they can code up to 25 slots now under PDGM, 25 spaces. For me to be able to take that on in-house, I would have to have a certified coding team. So I think it's going to be much more cost efficient to outsource this, knowing that people that are certified are going to know these codes and they're going to be able to give us um, the highest appropriate reimbursement possible. And then the last thing is certainly we have to continue to educate our referral sources and our physicians. Um, we're doing that using um, those most common ungroupable codes. These are the codes that they've been sending us. I'm actually attaching a letter with that and sending it to all of our providers, letting them know a little bit about the background of PDGM and the reason why we can no longer use these codes. So David, that's kind of my plan for our uh, questionable encounter or non-groupable codes. Great, Tammy. Uh, and I appreciate you mentioning the fact that, you know, using technology and also utilizing outsourcing as options uh, because this is a lot of information and process changes to digest. So, you know, I, I don't want to be afraid of using something, even if it's for a short term, short term uh, gain, uh, to move forward in the process. Yeah. So let's talk about focus number two, um, functional assessment. That has one of the biggest impacts that on our uh, payment reimbursement, and it's something that we you know, have not done well in the past. So, you know, I know this is the one thing that's um, left over from the OASIS item uh, to in the calculation. Um, I know that we've had our nurses do a lot of this information on the front end in the past, uh, but this is a potentially, you know, almost $1,200 financial impact on the episode. And we have additional items, uh, M items to the assessment. And I want to know how we're ensuring that we are doing the right assessment, a thorough assessment, and a, cons a consistent assessment. Yeah, so you're right and, and about one thing. There's a lot of money involved, and I appreciate you showing the slide where um, I, I was shocked when you gave me the $1,200 figure, um, and I thought there's no way there's $1,200 per episode. But if you can just explain that to me one more time, how that $1,200 is, is computed, that would be helpful for me. Right. And so we look at the different functional levels and what the impact, the financial impact is by each grouping. And you can see, you know, we have highs of 580 and lows of 431 highlighted here. So this is just for 30-day payments. So if we actually had two 30-day payments that were the high, that's almost $1,200. So that's what I'm talking about. Just those decisions and that functional assessment can affect our, our reimbursement by, like I said, almost $1,200. Well, that makes it very important for me to put in some operational items and, and to make sure that my staff is doing what they need to do to get an accurate um, OASIS assessment. One of the things that I have put in place is collaboration um, between the multidisciplinary team. CMS allows for multiple clinicians to collaborate on OASIS. And generally speaking, um, when we look at therapy and we look at nursing, therapy tends to, to do a more accurate assessment because they do a show me assessment versus a tell me questionnaire that nurses tend to ask just the questions and therapists actually tend to get them up and move them about. That's not 100%, but, but that's generally. If I can get out there, and I am getting out there within five days and making sure that my therapist is involved in that case early on, that nurse and that, that therapist can collaborate. They're able to perform that timely assessment, and I'm able to make adjustments to those functional items if I need to. The other big piece that 
that we kind of fell away from in the last couple of years is, is actually OASIS training and education. I find that this needs to be re, uh, repeated and repeated often, um, at least four times a year. I've added it to our in-service education calendar so that our staff will be trained in OASIS on a quarterly basis and not just trained, they'll have competency evaluations. And it may be that I look at levels of care. I may have some staff that can do routine visits, but can't do OASIS based on the fact that they can't make a certain score on the OASIS test. I'm looking at ways that I can put that into place so that I have uh, routine visit nurses and OASIS visit nurses. So my nurses that understand OASIS and perhaps are even certified uh, would be the ones that I have doing um, those OASIS questions. And I think the return on the investment uh, that it's going to cost to manage that testing and teaching and training is going to well pay for itself, just like you said, $1,200 an episode. Um, if we'll go to the next slide, um, I just wanted to show you a few other items I've been thinking about related to functional scoring um, and OASIS. So when we look at those items in functional scoring, these are the items that are being considered. And like you said, David, we did add two uh, new items to that. We added the M1800, which is grooming, um, and we also added the m uh, 1033, which is risk for hospitalization. This tip sheet I have printed out for all of the OASIS clinicians, and basically it gives tips in each area that, that talks about their ability rather than their willingness, and it also talks about um, their actual performance. So if I look at bathing, one of the tips is their will willingness and their actual performance to safely wash the entire body. Um, are they able to, you know, get to their feet? If they can't put on their shoes um, because they can't bend over, the fact that they're bathing their whole body is not going to happen. So teaching those kind of tips to clinicians is very important. And if you'll go to the next slide, I want to show you what one of our graphic designers did for us. They actually made up this room-by-room -room assessment um, of functional OASIS items. It is probably my favorite tool to use with OASIS clinicians. Um, I like to call it a five-minute OASIS, and it's how you get the most information you can from a patient in the first five minutes. And we do that through a show-me approach. Can you show me where your bathroom is so I can wash my hands? I want to do this before every visit because I want to protect you. I've been in other homes and as an infection control precaution, I'm going to wash my hands before and after every visit. As they're walking to that bathroom and you can see the dynamics of walking through the house, I'm able to watch them get up out of the chair. I'm able to see if they grimace when they get up. I'm able to see if they're shuffling their gait, if they're guarding, if they're using the walls as a way to use a device to keep them from falling. Once we get into that bathroom, if I take a look in that shower and if it's like uh, my grandmother's used to be full of Christmas decorations, I know they're not getting in and out of that bath independently because they can't be. It's all the way to the ceiling with um, last year's Christmas decorations. So that's going to tell me a lot about that patient. Oftentimes in the bathroom, I see evidence of incontinence, so I'm able to address that. Um, I'm also able to ask them to sit down on the toilet while we're there and, and see um, if they can touch their feet or remove their shoes so I can take a look at their feet. Uh, we have a huge diabetic population, so it makes sense. I need to check their feet anyways. And then on the way back from the bathroom, I actually walk them through the kitchen and I'm looking for things like, do I have smoke detectors in place? Are there trip hazards? Are there cords on the floor? Um, when we get in that kitchen, is there a way to cook? Is the kitchen clean? Is there nothing in the refrigerator? And I can ask questions about what they had for breakfast this morning. That's going to test their cognition and their ability to recall, but also their ability to um, understand their diet, and it's going to help me determine social determinants. So a lot I can do in that first five minutes of getting in the home. 
My clinicians are loving this functional scoring that, like I said, one of our graphic designers put together. They're actually tacking that up in their cubicles at, as a reminder, like for transfer and show me how you get off the bed. Show me how you get from your bed to the nearest chair. Show me how you get up and down for the chair. It's good techniques to teach our staff um, consistently how to score functional items. And if we'll just proceed to the next slide, David, um, I, I think that you wanted to talk to me about this wrap reduction, and I'm a little concerned about that. Yes, Tammy, this is one of the areas that we have already recognized and seen so far um, is the wrap reduction since we had some wraps paid and we saw that they were reduced 20%. Um, and that's going to occur for both billing periods. Uh, so it definitely affects our uh, cash flow. And, uh, you know, just trying to think of things that uh, potentially might be able to help us. It's basically the same process requirements uh, as we had before in PPS. We need an o a completed OASIS. We need a plan of care sent to the MD. And we need to have the first billable visit completed. You know, coming up on the second billing period, uh, hopefully everything else is still uh, there and completed and on day 31 uh, all we have to do is have the first billable visit completed uh, and then we can drop the next wrap but still 20% and 20% is still a much less reimbursement than we have before and it's spread out between 30 days. Um, the wrap is still required for the final claim so not filing this wrap timely can uh, affect our final and then also just a reminder is that this is the last year RAP will be used as a reimbursement and it will start penalizing us uh, as we don't do timely RAPs. I did a quick summary of how much impact this does. If you look at this scenario, we have an institutional um, early and late, uh, early on the first period and late on the second period. Uh, uh, wound grouping and the functional hive with no co comorbidity. Uh, we look at the case mix, the reimbursement for the first 30 days would have been 3120. Uh, the second 30 days would have been 2781. Uh, total episode would have been 5901. In the old days, we would have gotten 60% of that, you know, at the front end of our episode, which would have been a little bit over $3,500. Right now, I got a check for $624 for the first 30 days, and I'll probably get that second uh, 20 20% uh, for the second 30 days here shortly. I'm still only 1180 without the final coming in. So significant cash flow juggling that I'm having to do. Uh, so what is it that we can do to help make sure that we're getting these wraps done timely so that we can minimize the cash flow impact? Yeah, David, thank you. And thank you for that visual. I, I knew you were on me to get these wraps out quicker and, and we were condensing that time. But until I actually saw that visual, it didn't hit home to me that, you know, we're not even getting a quarter of our wrap payments anymore. Um, so that is, that's a significant impact on cash flow, on payroll, on many things. Uh, when you first told me that I needed to get my wrap down to a five day uh, or possibly at the most six-day cycle, um, I didn't understand it. So thanks for that visual. I've actually used that to help train my staff. Um, nurses are very visual people, as, as you know. We like to see things. We like to understand the rationale. A lot of times, you know, some of my colleagues say, well, you shouldn't mix um, financial with, you know, with clinical. But I think we have to. I think once the staff understands um, that, that that money has really reduced. They understand the reason for getting in that timely uh, documentation. And I think that's the first thing that we've stressed is that OASIS has to be completed and submitted timely. You know, we cannot wait um, seven, eight days to get an OASIS in. The other part of that to make that happen is point of care documentation. Um, that has to be done at the bedside or as much of that OASIS as possible uh, must be done at the bedside. Um, and if we can do that, uh, we're going to cut down the amount of time it takes um, to get that, that wrap done. We want to make sure that that billable visit is occurring at, during OASIS. 
So making sure we can get our workflow through the QA process quickly is very important to us. Making sure our QA nurses or our clinical managers, director of nurses are checking to make sure that billable visit has occurred so that wrap can drop. Some things that I like doing is using physicians portals um, to, to push my orders and my plan of care through. Once that's completed, I like to push it through there. Um, and I know which doctors like to receive it which ways. So, you know, we, we know there's still a few um, old school doctors out there that want our staff to hand deliver, mainly because they want them to bring the candy when they come. Um, and we understand that. But for as much as we can, we're pushing that electronically um, so that we can get that wrapped through um, that plan of care created and sent to that physician very quickly. Um, I, we are down, and I think you've seen our numbers come down. Uh, we were at an eight-day wrap. We're about six days now. I'm trying hard for that five-and-a-half-day wrap. We are having a bit of delay um, working with our new coding partners and, and getting all that coding done up front and then a re-look at that coding once our nurse comes in. Um, so that's taken a little bit of time for us, but we're, we're streamlining that and we're working that process. And I think by next month, you'll see me down to that five-day RAF requirement. Um, if we could just uh, go to the next slide, please. And I'll let you um, kind of tell me about lupus and hopefully I'm getting down um, to that national average now. Yeah, that, this is another, you know, I appreciate your information about the wrap. And just, just to reiterate, you know, we have the rest of the year to really get to that five uh, day before we actually start getting penalized and actually affects our total reimbursement. So uh, we definitely need to keep uh, the, the pushing and, and making sure that we adjust and make all the adjustments in the process along to get to that point. So the next focus you know, is, is LUPA, or Low Utilization Payment Adjustment. Um, I know that we have 432 LUPAs now uh, because it's affected by each different grouping. Uh, it also varies from two to six uh, on the visit threshold. Uh, so anything below the threshold will cause a LUPA. Um, and each one of these defined, like I said, by the grouping and the episodic timing. Uh, it also, you know, basically what happens when a LUPA occurs is it breaks the episodic reimbursement and it becomes a fee-for-service payment. So I need to make sure that we're not having, uh, we understand that there's going to be some causes of LUPA and we've talked about avoidable and unavoidable LUPAs before, uh, but we need to make sure that we're monitoring this and, and making sure that we're not having a uh, adjustment downward in our reimbursement caused by uh, lupus that we're not prepared to deal with. Yeah, exactly, David. And one thing that, that I had to share with my staff is actually just redefine what lupa is and what visits count towards the lupa threshold. So all billable visits count towards the lupa threshold, which includes our home health aid visits, our nursing visits, and our therapy visits, and our social work visits. So getting my staff to understand that and understand the importance of us scheduling those visits was the start of my training um, with the LUPA impact. Um, but utilizing your slides here um, was, was a huge help um, in showing them where those LUPA thresholds fail. So if you could just one more time just kind of educate me to, to the dollar amount so I can make sure that I'm telling that correctly to my staff. Yeah, and, and you know, looking at this a little bit, just looking at the loop of thresholds, you know, the two to six visits, you'll see that it's weighted. There's very few situations that six visits, uh, fewer that, you know, there are some that are five, but most of them are that two to four. So that's still not a whole bunch of visits uh, before you actually get below the threshold. Um, and looking at the different early and late, you'll also see that it swings from that three to five area into the two to three area, uh, depending on early and late. So really that first, that second period, that second 30 day period, you could really miss an or, or miss a lupa because it's so few visits that actually have to be, you know, be done. In the first visit, in, in scheduling a note becomes a big key component to this. 
Um, you know, knowing if, if you schedule three visits and it's a three threshold that there's a high likelihood of one missed visit that could throw you, uh, break that episodic payment and go to a per visit. You can see the loop of rates in 2020 right now. Um, and if you add up these different loop of rates on a 30 day payment with a loop of adjustment and just say that we had four nursing visits in the first 30 days, you could actually see a decrease in revenue of almost $1,300. So it's a very impactful uh, risk that's out there. And I know that there's a lot of things that we can do operationally to try to make sure that we identify if those are going to happen and when, when those are going to happen so that we can uh, avoid these. Yeah, and you're right. We do have um, some loopers that I would call non-avoidable. Um, those fully catheter changes um, certainly um, are, are a non-avoidable lupa, and we know that going in. But knowing that we have almost $1,200 um, that could happen with avoidable lupa, um, I, I really looked at, you know, how we can educate the staff and how we can get down our lupa rate to, you know, even below national average, which is about 8.1% here. One of those areas is patient satisfaction. And what I discovered is, you know, when patients aren't satisfied, they often refuse, vi refuse visits, or if they don't see the value in the visit, they'll refuse that care. Sometimes they'll even discharge us early because we're, we're talking about people from the veterans or the silent generation. Um, they don't want to waste resources. Um, doesn't matter if they're not paying for it. The government's paying for it. That's a resource. So they have to see value out of that care. So getting that patient satisfaction scores up is very important. We're currently at about a four uh, star rating. We're pushing to get that up to a five star rating and that elite uh, five star scheduling, uh, I'm sorry, that five star patient satisfaction rating, as well as outcome. We wanna make sure that we're not uh, going into the hospital or the emergency care more often than the national average. I'd like for it to be half of the national average because that's gonna allow me to contract with other vendors other than Medicare. But specifically for lupus, if they go in the hospital, it's gonna be very difficult for me to avoid a lupa. And that's kind of what you see in the graphic that I put up here for my staff. I wanted to show them how important it is for us to do some measures like tuck-in calls on the weekend, making sure our patients are okay and set for the weekend because we know that that's when most of our patients access the emergency system. If you look at the top where we did that start care on Thursday, you can see that we planned our visit so that we would have several touch points during the week for our patient. Um, you can also see that we got our PT evaluation in just a little bit over that five day period. Um, that should have been planned for that Monday because, again, we want that five-day evaluation to occur so that we can make sure we can coordinate that functional assessment. But, but this particular case manager still has some training issues to do with uh, scheduling and getting in those therapy evals quickly. But we had one, two, three, four, five visits planned um, prior to that Sunday when that patient called and told us they were headed to the hospital or they were at the hospital. So we missed our visit on Monday, we missed it on Tuesday, and we missed it on Wednesday. So we missed an awful lot of visits there. Um, if our lupa threshold was a six visit lupa threshold, and when the patient came out of the hospital on Thursday, if I don't see that patient on Friday, I'm gonna cause myself a scheduling lupa. We have 48 hours to see that patient. So with my staffing crisis that I have going on, it would be very easy for me to push that visit to a Saturday. But if I push that visit to the Saturday, I just lost $1,200 of reimbursement of what I'd like to call um, an avoidable lupa. So very, very important that, again, nurses aren't computers. We need visuals. Um, we looked for technology to assist us with this, to tell us what those lupa thresholds are. Not only that, but to tell us if, if we schedule a patient for a once a week and we schedule them past the end of billing cycle, that that, comes, that software is going to tell us, hey, if you push this patient over, you know, one or two days, it's not going to create a lupa. 
Uh, are you sure you want to schedule this visit for Saturday? Those are some enhancements that you know we're going to have to rely on software to do for us because again, nurses aren't computers. Um, my staff are going to have to start calling in their missed visits on a daily basis. We started that. We've had them call and let us know immediately if that visit is missed. And it's a funny thing, David, uh, most of my missed visits are those um, that I would call the undesirable visits. Either they're more than 30 miles away from the office or it's those patients that are quite difficult to get along with. It's amazing how all of those are the patients that always refuse services. So by having a director of nursing kind of look over those missed visits and make some phone calls, you would be surprised how much I've driven down my missed visits in the last 30 days. So I think we're going to continue that um, as best practice for sure. The other thing that I'm doing is pulling data analytics. I want to make sure that that point of care documentation is happening in the home. I want to make sure that they're completing their note timely. And then also, I want to pull scorecards on each of my individual staff because if I have certain staff members that have a lot more missed visits than the other, are a lot more times that they're not documenting within 24 hours and closing out that note, I have um, a training opportunity uh, with those particular clinicians. If we'll go to the next page, I, I just wanted to show you, I think, um, the visit utilization and just explain to you a little bit why this is happening. And it's, it's liable to happen more in the second 30 days than the first 30 days. This is CMS data. And this takes in all the claims um, of all home health agencies. And you can see a pattern here. You can see what we like to call clinically front-loading visits. We have been taught to front-load visits and taper off towards the end of the episode as a clinical best practice to prevent hospitalization and to prevent emergency room visits. And by doing that, oftentimes what we do is we don't have enough visits in the second 30 days to prevent those lupus. So certainly we want to look at that. We want to, uh, we want to understand that that's a trend and that's the way we did things under PPS when we didn't worry about lupus in each 30 day period. We only worried about them in 60 days. Again, another reason to have technology help you with that scheduling piece and identifying those lupus. And if we'll take the next slide, um, the other thing I want to mention about lupus and things to avoid with lupus is that PEPPER report. Um, and we'll just go back one slide, David, and I just want to show folks really quick. Um, I live here in Texas, in San Antonio, actually. And the PEPPER report is something that's not often pulled. Only about 50% of our agencies are even pulling their PEPPER report. And the PEPPER report is actually a really good tool to help you see where you stand um, with your visit utilization. It's also going to help you identify areas that you may be at risk for. Believe me, your surveyors are pulling these PEPPER reports as well. Talking about the last 30 days and just things to consider in that last 30 days, um, maintenance therapy is one I'll mention here because under maintenance therapy now with the new final rule, we can actually have um, PTAs or PT assistants doing maintenance therapy. That's huge for us as we can lower those costs to still create those very positive outcomes. Other things that we wanna consider is M&E, our management and evaluation of care plans. And David, on our next slide, I just put together a little graph for you and I think you're gonna be pretty proud of me because. I pulled some numbers myself. <laughs> I wanted to show you a late community, low comorbidity, mid-functional case that is actually one of our patients that is currently on M&E, our management and evaluation of care plan. Uh, my case mix was a 0.7812, which is about $1,400. So I looked at how we were scheduling patients for that 30-day period. And you can see that on my graph on the right-hand side. And you can see that I'm using home health aids twice a week and skilled nursing twice a week, but I'm also incorporating telemonitoring. So I'm incorporating a lot of KPIs into the system. And every other week I'm making a telephone call to that patient and tucking them in. Because again, I still want those really good outcomes and those tele touch point visits, they're gonna help me get there. 
And when I look on that left-hand side and I look at my cost per visit, we can see my AIDS cost about $542. Um, my RNs cost about $300 near about. And when we look at the, the total reimbursement and we subtract the cost of visits, we have about $629 margin of episode. So a gross margin of 629 when we're looking at an M and E case that is late community is a pretty significant margin. So in further training, I'm really going to start training my staff on M and E. This is a skill that's been around forever in home health. We're just not really good at utilizing it. So David, that's on my uh, in-service plan um, for for this year is more detailed training on M and E and making sure my staff know how to document that that they don't just use it for custodial care. We use it when it's appropriate and we follow the guidelines. Okay, um, I think you wanted to talk about focus four. Yes, I did. Uh, great. Now, I, I like to hear that you're using analytics and we're, we're talking about finance and, and, and we're communicating this operationally. Uh, so I think it's, uh, this is the two step that we absolutely need to continue doing. So focus number four, we're talking about changes in plan of care. I know there's been a couple of little things that occurred in PDGM that's a little bit differently. I know we've had skicks or significant change in condition for a long time, uh, but these are now, you know, could affect how we get reimbursed because we have two billing periods now. So I know this normally occurs when you have an unanticipated change in a patient's condition. Uh, we, we use it and, and other follow-up OASIS to perform this, and I know it will affect our HIPS code, but there's also a change of focus, a change of focus. Uh, this is really where the primary diagnosis changes, and it's not, it's something that was not unanticipated, uh, and it's, but it actually can affect my reimbursement also in a code in the second 30-day period. Can we talk about how we're going to identify this, what we need to do to communicate it to make sure that I'm billing correctly? Yeah, and I, I have to say that um, when we're looking at the impact of these clinical groupings, um, you, you certainly made me understand the fact that there's a reason that we need to focus on these change of focus forms. There's a lot of additional reimbursement there, um, and especially not just for the primary, but the secondary diagnoses, which are the comorbidity adjustments as well. Uh, when you uh, gave me that information and I shared that with my staff, they, they understand now why we're changing our process and we're doing 30-day reviews. I think on the next slide, I may actually have a picture of you of what's within our system. This is um, actually in our EMR system. It's a change of focus form. Um, and that change of focus form, oops, um, I think we, if we could go back maybe one slide or forward one slide. We wanna, we wanna show that change of focus form. Um, that change of focus form that's in our EMR is a, it's a way to summarize a change from a primary diagnosis um, in the second 30-day period. And, and when we look at our, our comorbidity example, we know change of focus can impact both the primary diagnosis and the secondary diagnosis. Looking here at these comorbidity examples, we're able to see just kind of a listing of some of those examples that may play in to the change of focus. So this is actually within my EMR system. Um, it's a change of focus form that allows us to change the primary and secondary diagnosis. So first of all, I want to stress what you said, David. Um, my staff are still very confused about, you know, when do I do a change of focus and when do I do a skit? Operationally, we are now doing 30-day reviews. I have a dashboard that actually tells me when a 30-day review is due. And kind of like our 60-day reviews, we're starting those five days before the 30-day review is completed. We're making those intradisciplinary, not multidisciplinary. And when I say intra, that means all of us get together and we talk about what's going on in, with the patient. And we decide if all of our goals have been met and we need to change our focus of care from what we originally did on a primary diagnosis to one of those subsequent or secondary diagnosis codes. 
Um, and, and a good example of this is, is possibly, uh, this is actually one of our patients, so I'll, I'll go ahead and use that example. Uh, we had a patient that had um, a stroke and they fell and they hit their head and they, they um, had a pretty large gash. They also, um, they also damaged their arm. Um, they had you know, some severe um, injuries um, during that fall. But a stroke is what caused that fall. When we got the patient, um, that patient was not able to work on rehab. Um, they were not ready for rehab yet. We, we really had to focus on um, those wounds and that skin integrity. Um, there had been some infection in the hospital. So our focus of care was actually on those wounds. But after 30 days, um, you know, the wounds improved significantly, the patient improved significantly, and we knew we really wanted to start focusing on rehab. And we had that stroke or cerebral ischemia down as one of our subsequent diagnoses. So during our intradisciplinary um, team conference, our 30-day review, um, the team decided that, yes, this patient was ready for rehab. We're ready to start on some basic um, physical therapy and occupational therapy. So at that point, I wanted to change my diagnosis um, to that CVA diagnosis, knowing that I was within the first 60 days, um, that's still an acute diagnosis. I don't have to use that late effect code. So I needed to change that focus. So my form here that I'm showing you on the left actually allows me to do that in the EMR system. I'm able to make those changes and reorder those diagnoses. It'll automatically regenerate that HIP code for me. Um, and, and David, it's going to send that immediately to your billers. It's going to flow immediately to the claim form. The other important thing with this form is that it's also going to document medical necessity. And there's those examples, again, of those comorbidities. And, and you can see uh, that all of these comorbidity examples uh, will pay us additional money um, if we use these. I want to show you the high comorbidity examples as well. Um, and this is where you need your coders, guys, because these are all pairing. And you have to have a code from pairing one and pairing two on the same claim form to get a high comorbid um, diagnosis. This is only occurring about 10% of the time that we're seeing in our claims. But just for an example, um, if a patient had heart failure in a secondary code, not in the primary, but one of the secondary codes, and they also had an abscess of the right foot, that's gonna give you that high comorbid um, diagnosis. That's why Medicare has allowed us so many spaces now um, to make those secondary claims uh, or those secondary diagnoses because there's, a, there's an opportunity to get a high comorbid um, diagnosis. Again, I'm only seeing it in about 10% of my claim, but I'm seeing that low comorbid, uh, comorbid um, adjustment occur in about 50% of my claim. Um, David, I hope that makes sense and that helps people and helps you to understand how important it is now for us to do those 30-day reviews. No, absolutely. And I think that's a big key. And I think it's, it's, it's wonderful how we're utilizing different aspects of it and using the team fully to make these changes and adjustments as we move forward. So finally, we're coming down to the last the focus five right now, and which really is the final claim. So this is something we have not done yet. We're days away uh, from producing our final claim. So I want to make sure that we understand what's what's required, what's needed, so that we can get the final claim in as quickly as possible so that we can get the reimbursement. So it's really the same requirements as before. We're just on 30-day billing periods. So we have to have the OASIS into the key system with the iKey system now. Uh, within 30 days of the assessment. And then we need the face-to-face -face and the certification statement completed. We need all the physician order signed, uh, which I know is complicated, but we have to get this information in there. Uh, visits are completed and posted, and the wrap is processed. Now, one thing I want to, you know, even though this may be the first time we have this process, sequential billing is not required uh, under PDGM. 
uh, it's something that's in hospice, but it's not in home health. Uh, we can bill out of order, so I can actually bill a final if, if the other one's not ready. I can bill a second 30-day uh, final not uh, before I do the first 30-day final. But all of that can said, what is it that we can do operationally to help make sure that all of this information is in our billers' hands as quickly as possible so that we can get the final bill out? Yeah, that, that's a lot. <laughs> um, first of all is our workflow improvements. Um, we, we have to tighten up that face-to-face -face, um, so that we can drop that final claim pretty quickly. Uh, we have to start tracking that at the point of intake. Um, and when I say develop a process for pre-claim management, I'm not talking about RCD. I'm talking about every point of the way needs to be concurrent um, billing. So everything that we're doing, we need to be monitoring those orders every day to make sure that they're signed and back. We need to make sure that all of our um, uh, notes are coming in timely so that we can get them on the bill. We need to make sure that our utilization is um, appropriate and that we're doing appropriate resource management. I think if we can get all of this started at the very front, um, I like to call it concurrent billing. Um, I like to start that the minute the patient comes in the door. We need to be working towards that billing process. So we're really tightening up those workflows, David, so that we can make sure that our orders are back timely and that that face-to-face -face is there, it's documented, and that we're able to drop that claim as soon as possible after that 30-day end of billing cycle. Yes, Tammy, and I think this is one of the key things that, that it's so important in billing in PDGM. If we have all of the operational processes and systems and deliverables in place as quickly as possible, the billing is fairly simple. Agreed. So talk about, and I just real quickly, I just wanted to make, you know, remind everybody there there is payment adjustments, there's PEPs and outliers. Uh, basically, those have not significantly changed in, or have not significantly changed from the way it was in PPS. Uh, basically, on a 30-day payment period, you will have a partial episode payment. Uh, if you have a transfer to another agency or discharge uh, within the first 30-day period, uh, uh, also a change of plan, switching from traditional Medicare to a Medicare Advantage plan, uh, but that's on a 30-day period now. Um, outliers. Um, also are on 30-day payment periods and you know basically if you have additional costs based on a, a cost per unit 15-minute uh, unit uh, they will reimburse you 80 percent of the difference between your additional cost and or your additional reimbursement and your additional cost uh, so right now they did change the fbl which is the fixed dollar loss to be 0.56 so there will be a little bit harder to get an outlier uh, but Basically, the, those two adjustments are the same, except they're uh, calculated on 30-day periods. Um, anything that you had to add or help on that, Tammy? Well, no, I'll just say that we don't have a lot of the outliers, but certainly the PEP. You know, I, I, I think we just have to be really cognizant of if that patient um, has been with another agency as well. Um, and we're certainly getting that information from the claims form. So, you know, oftentimes if they're not satisfied with another agency, you know, they'll discharge early and, and kind of agency shop. Um, so we are watching for those tips um, as we're checking the claims data. Great. So, you know, we said before that we were dancing, so now the music's playing. So I want to make sure that we keep operations and finance in perfect step. Uh, we've got still a ways to go before we make full adjustment into PDGM and our operational changes, uh, but I, we're still doing the two-step, and we'll continue doing it for the next several months. Thank you, David, and I certainly appreciate these weekly meetings, and if we could just keep those up, it's a huge benefit to myself and my staff. All right. Well, thank you so much, Tammy and David. Uh, some very helpful insights that I'm sure will help a lot of agency leaders on this webinar better navigate the transition to PDGM. Um, just a quick reminder to everybody who is tuning in that slides and audio will be made available once this webinar concludes. I'm going to now open up the floor to a couple of questions. Uh, we'll try to be 
brief in answers because I know that we're butting up against our timing here. Um, we do have a lot of folks who sent in answers. If we don't get to them right now, uh, Access or Home Healthcare News will be sure to follow up. So uh, don't you worry. Uh, first question here though is for Tammy, I believe. And somebody wants to know, we are a large agency and must be able to process our wraps timely. We have decided to move our coding to intake in order to promote our cash flow. What things should we consider from a compliance standpoint for changing operations to place coding at intake? That's a great question. So just to keep it really quick, um, again, remembering you cannot make that final determination of that primary diagnosis until that nurse goes out into the home or therapist and assesses that patient. So just making sure you have a process in place um, that you circle back after the assessment has been completed and make sure that that primary diagnosis is reflected on what you're going to concentrate on and what that primary focus of care is. It's going to be extremely important. But I do know of a lot of large agencies that's doing the same thing and pushing their coding um, kind of to the, to the front of operations. So I'm sure you'll find a way to, to work that process out. And David, it looks like I have a question here for you. Uh, you. You mentioned Medicare Advantage. Somebody wants to know, we have a diverse payer population with only about 48% being traditional Medicare. How will PDGM affect other payer types? How do I find out if Medicare Advantage plans will pay using PDGM? So, good question, and we are still going through some of this also. Um, PDGM is not a requirement for Medicare Advantage plans. It's a choice. Uh, we did not get a lot of information of ones that were changing um, prior to uh, January 1st, but we are now starting to hear different uh, payers that are moving towards PDGM. Some are fully adopting it, some are adopting partial components of it. So uh, the best thing that I can suggest to you is make sure that you contact every one of your payers, so your Medicare Advantage plans and truly understand when they're gonna follow PDGM that you understand what they're following, if it's the entire PDGM process or if it's portions of it. Uh, the, you know, Make sure that you understand any nuances that they have. Again, it's not a requirement for, uh, for Medicare Advantage, but the best thing I can do is com tell you is communicate with your payers. All right, well, it does look like we're out of time for today. I wanna to thank everybody who took the time to attend today's webinar. And a final thank you to Tammy and David, along with Access. Uh, we do still have a lot of questions in our inbox here. So again, if we didn't get to them, Access or Home Healthcare News will be sure to follow up with you afterwards. Uh, we have your email, we have your questions. We'll make sure that uh, those get to Tammy and David so they could follow up with you. Um, and again, you will be sent an email uh, with a recording of today's webinar and a copy of the slides. Thanks and have a great day, everyone. Thank you for joining our on-demand training today. Access is the only home health care technology company approved by the American Nurses Credentialing Center to offer continuing education credits and the most recommended home health software on software advice. You can watch more on-demand training videos through our industry-leading help center or at access.com where you'll find tutorials, blogs, white papers, and answers to frequently asked questions. Access. Empowering care anytime, anywhere.